comes up for me, and then I think, but you know whether you have friends or not. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you have lonely kids that don't have friends. And I know from my own children, I was real aware of the kids in kindergarten and first and second grade that I would say are going to have problems. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, by middle school, they were having problems, and they dropped out in high school and started having alcohol and drug problems, and pregnancies were related for the young ladies. And, um, you know, it, I was going to say no, and then reality says, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. Now, if they're not in touch with their feelings, if they don't have that awareness, they probably can't verbalize it. Maybe that's the key, because what he did talk about was a feeling of vocabulary, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so that perhaps that's, that's important, yeah. that they don't know how to say that. How about in adulthood? Well, the adults who've been told since they were very small that they don't fit the mold. The, I work with students who have learning disabilities or attention deficit disorder. They've been called that. And they understood very early they weren't like other kids. And they were segregated, and they became isolated. And people who are isolated don't develop good social skills, because you can't do that if you don't have a good friend or a group that you can belong to. So their social cues may have been off in the beginning, but they don't get any better, because nobody's really overtly helping them catch up with what they've lost that's until. A, that's a, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's, that's a wonderful right. point in terms of needing a place to practice. Yeah. But it's not like we're born with social skills. I mean, we need a place to, yeah. to be engaged yeah. and do that. But this, this topic feels to me particularly poignant here in the Bay Area because one of uh, the traditional stereotypes of a lot of people who work in the uh, computer technology <laughs> industry is that profound split where you have someone who's very, very bright um, in academia and very bright mm -hmm. and, and perhaps uh, superior intelligence who then has difficulty maintaining a relationship or difficulty engaging their wife or children or, mm -hmm. um, and, and that, that sort of painful sense of, well, if I'm so smart in this area, what, you know, am I just not trying? Yeah. What's wrong with me that I'm not able to, to learn these skills? Goldman talks about how in the workplace, the people who he called the stars were the people with people skills, mm -hmm. the ones who were good at getting a group to work together and who had nice relationships with everyone and who were kind of easygoing in a bad situation. They didn't get excited or angry. Um, he said that they were the stars, and when they did some studies, I thought it was interesting, they did IQ tests and personality tests on a whole spectrum of people, and the stars didn't have better IQ or worse IQ. Um, they didn't have personality tests that would indicate that they were going to be the successful ones. The real difference was just this emotional literacy, as he called it. Yeah. They had better control of their emotional uh, state, mm -hmm. and they empathized better with other people. Mm -hmm. So um, IQ tests and academic achievement are not a high predictor for success in the workplace, which is something the university doesn't want to really think about a lot, because um, if that's not the key thing to be learning, then there sh maybe should be another component going on at mm -hmm. every level of education that brings people along so they can be stars too. Well, yeah, and mm -hmm. recognizing people's talents. I read uh, this week in conjunction with Emotional Intelligence a really marvelous book um, called Why uh, When uh, smart, um, smart People Do Dumb Things mm -hmm. and talks mm -hmm. about what he did was talk about um, what happens, he used all sorts of famous people for examples who have like, he called them superior intellect, um, who, who in one bold move would sabotage their career, do something outstandingly stupid, and <laughs> lose everything they had. And he cited all sorts of politicians yeah. and people yeah. who had done that, and that sort of curiosity. And one of the things he talked about that potentially might explain how that could happen is that the over-reliance on the intellect mm -hmm. in terms of the feedback you get or the kinds of people you even listen to for feedback if you're not as smart as I am, then I'm not going to, to hear you. what yeah. you have to say. And so wind up um, stumbling over, in every single occasion, something in this emotional intelligence realm. Yeah. That, you know, yeah, you're very, very smart, but, you know, Can't judgment judge sometimes is yeah. a little off. <laughs> well, the old typical stereotype of the engineer and the nerd, um, I mean, that just kind of comes right out of this book. You know, mm -hmm. you think of the the super IQs and how often their emotional life, their family life, is not rich, I guess is the word mm -hmm. I would use. It's mm -hmm. not full. Well, and also, it seems to me that um, if, we, if we test children early, 
And they're told early on, you're such a bright boy, you're such a bright mm -hmm. little girl, you're so smart. In some ways, I think academia um, tends to foster that intellectual development. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe even gearing children toward the maths, toward the yeah. sciences, yeah. the mm -hmm. things that are not necessarily connected to the heart, so that um, they're not even, maybe even um, exposed to other types of intelligence because they're gifted in this area. Okay. I'm not sure it's the subject that isolates them, though. I think it's the way it's taught. Huh. You can study environmental biology in a book in a classroom mm -hmm. by yourself, mm -hmm. and you can go out in a pond with 20 people and study the mm -hmm. same thing. So I suspect that it's mm -hmm. our school system is isolating. We teach children to learn individually. We don't even want them to talk to each other or share answers. They're cheating if they do That's that. That's true. So That's we keep true. them very isolated. They kind of march along a straight path, and so there isn't much group work, and there isn't sharing of answers or ideas or solutions, and there isn't a problem-solving approach to education. It's mostly about learn what I know, and I'm going to tell you, and then you give it back. And right. that doesn't develop the kind of problem-solving interpersonal skills that are going to be needed later on. You know, one of the new movements in education, though, is the collaborative classroom. Yes. And yeah. that does do what you're talking about mm -hmm. in the sense of putting teams together trying to have every student work at their strength and so that as a team then you have the strength in all the areas. Um, so I do see that coming and of course that's helping children with the learning difficulties as well um, because they may be very strong in one area and weaker in another area. Well and, and that's an excellent point. You know one of the, the things I do is train um, um, alcohol and drug counselors at mm -hmm. San Jose City College and what I keep, what I see every year when we get to the internship component, where they oh, go out and right. do field work, okay, this. I have some of the students who traditionally have a 4.0 get out into actual application where they begin to do counseling with clients and come up against a roadblock mm -hmm. because their academic skills aren't translating into uh, field performance. Yeah. Where then again, I've got students who may have been, you know, working real hard for C. Uh, who mm -hmm. get out and start doing counseling and yes. absolutely shine. And how, you know, it, unfortunately, it, it, that's the only point um, in academia often where, um, in my experience, even as a student, I was given credit for that kind of, yeah, a, of skill. Yeah. I mean, yeah. usually it's did you memorize <coughs> and regurgitate. Right. And so um, it, that's an excellent point in terms of how we teach and how we forget to honor those who might not memorize well but can really translate what they learn into actual competency. Yeah. A few years ago, it was interesting that Harvard University, their medical school, took a look at the graduating doctors who were dropping out of the profession after a few years because they hated working with patients. Huh? And they said, we're wasting a lot of time and money training people who don't know until they get out there that they don't really like working with people. They felt that they were screening for academic IQ. They were taking people with high grades into the program. So what they did was change the whole way they do it. Now they, they teach in sections, and they begin working in the clinics right from the first year. So they find out very early if this is something they want to do, if they can react in an interpersonal way with client, uh, patients and one another, for that matter, or if they really are just academic kinds of um, achievers who prefer to work alone in some research capacity, and they need to find that out before they get out there with a shingle mm -hmm. on the door. Absolutely. Well, you know, and, that, and being able to value both. Yes. There's nothing wrong yeah. with being gifted Absolutely. in research. Exactly. You know, and that's, you know, a lot of my students will, after the internship, decide, you know, I, I don't want to do counseling. I want to teach, yeah. or I want to work in prevention, or I want to do something mm -hmm. other than one-on-one -on -one work, because for exactly that reason. You know, you know, I, I don't know if I want to listen to people's problems during the day. <laughs> <laughs> But wouldn't it be better if we found that out before they graduated oh, as I yes. know. I mean, we need to start that process very early. I, when I yeah. get to talk to teachers, I tell them children should start learning what intelligence says are strengths for them mm -hmm. right on, right from the beginning, and begin to develop those strengths and use those strengths in a real uh, conscious way to achieve, and then find out what they're not so good at and develop that and find ways to work around those mm -hmm. weaker areas right from the beginning because that way they know they're who they are and what they're equipped with and can steer themselves a little more consciously into some area that will work. Now you have an upcoming training, I believe, on this, on the seven intelligences and how to apply them. Do you? I think you have that. Yes, yeah. uh, we have it here. 
Um, it's March 1st, and it's a whole day. It's a Saturday. And um, the number to call is 294-8860 for more information. It's quite a while from now. Okay, so it's um, March 1st. March 1st. 294-8860. Oops. Oops, that's no problem. Um, oh, you got the cat wet. To be able to, that's right, I got the kitty wet. Oh, well. Um, so, yeah, so at some point there'll be an opportunity for people to come and hear you and maybe really yes. learn how to apply this because, well, I think it's very useful to start with children. Unfortunately, a lot of us are grown-ups reading this book and so yeah. that leads us to, uh, in the final few minutes, what do we do about this? It's already being uh, tackled a little bit in um, Juvenile Hall. They, they train on anger management yes. and how to think before you act and how to know what you're doing and feeling. So they're, they're doing those basic steps that you first were showing, and they're trying to teach them. And again, they're real late coming at them with this information. It could be done in uh, grade school and high school better before the problems begin. But at least they're aware that this is one of the things that'll help young people uh, make different kinds of choices. Mm -hmm. Well, it would seem to me as adults, too, you'd have to value interpersonal skills to be willing to take the time That's to learn right. them. I and that may be one of the values of the book, is it, you know, it, it validates, it puts something in writing for us that says this is important, here's the research behind it, here's the brain chemistry, this is what the brain looks like and what developed, you know, correctly and not so well, and, and really made this tangible and real so we can now begin to say this exists. And, and you're right in terms of uh, our culture in general is very linear, very concrete. Mm -hmm. we, we live in a culture that if I can see it, it's real. So, yeah, the fact that it's actually in a book somewhere will um, give enormous <laughs> credibility to those of us who fought so all along. Yeah. So, um, I want to thank you both for coming tonight and making the time to, to talk about this with us. And uh, hopefully March 1st you'll see a lot of us, our viewers. Yes. Um, so we've had uh, Rosemary and Joan with us. Thank you for coming. In the upcoming weeks, we're going to address obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm Mary Crocker Cook. Good night. suggestions write to Bay Area Psychology at 1723 Hamilton Avenue, Suite A, San Jose, California 95125.